Okay, so as I mentioned, my name is Jacob Simmons, Senior Trends and Operations Planner at RTC. Uh, so we're going to be talking here today about working within constraints, the data and the theory that's used to produce RTC's annual transit service changes. And to start out with, RTC is well known in terms of transit for a lot of major studies and initiatives that we have going on. Right now we have the Maryland Parkway project, uh, which is currently in the environmental assessment phase. We also have the transportation investment business plan for the core area that wrapped up uh, earlier this year, last year. Those are major important projects, major capital projects. Um, however, that's not the focus of this presentation. This presentation is about everything else that has to do with the uh, as we go kind of transit planning, the day-to-day -day type of transit planning that affects the current bus-only network for the Las Vegas area. We have close to 200,000 boardings per weekday that occur on our system today, and this talks about a lot of the data and rationale that underlies what that system is today and what we're trying to do with that portion of our system as we look towards these major projects to help us uh, make upgrades to specific corridors. But uh, d despite the large projects, there's always going to be a, a need and a place for, for the more uh, below the radar type of transit planning and projects that affect most of the major corridors throughout the Las Vegas Valley. So perhaps not the ones that qualify for the top level treatment, but the ones that folks still need to get around. So that's what we're going to be talking about here today. So really the way I want to start this is talking about transit route design, transit network design, how routes are designed and, and how they're supposed to work together. What works well, what doesn't work well for transit route design. So the guiding principle that we use is to respect customers' time. And what that means is, is a handful of things. We know that transit Operating in mixed flow, uh, making local stops, is inherently slow. It is not time competitive with driving alone. We're aware of this, which is why it's important that within that constraint, we do everything we can to avoid adding more additional time, that we try to minimize that additional time to the maximum extent possible, recognizing that there are limitations. So one of the ways we do that is to be as direct as possible. That means operating routes in a straight line on major arterials, deviating as little as possible. Uh, we're going to be showing uh, what our current system looks like in a bit, but most of our system is designed similar to how our roads are designed, where we will have transit service operating on a major corridor from roughly one end of the valley to the next. And again, as often in as straight of a line as possible because the majority of customers are trying to go across or trying to get through. Anytime you deviate off of a major arterial, you are adding a time penalty to everyone who is on that bus that is not going to that one particular destination. So for the, for the greater good, it's important to be as straight and direct as possible. This is an example of that. So again, this kind of goes to what makes it a good bus route design. It, this could apply to just about any mode concept is being as direct as possible. The image on the left, this might be great if you're trying to access this location. This design is great for that compared to this. But in order to get to this location, which might serve a couple customers, everyone else who's on that bus has to endure the extra time that's necessary. And if you think about our roadways, our freeways, we don't design like that. We don't design uh, our freeway so that all the traffic has to get off at one exit for those who are using that exit. There are, uh, the, those that are continuing on are not inconvenienced by that deviation. Respecting customers' time also means forming continuous longer routes from shorter arterials as much as possible or impractical to avoid unnecessary transfers, right? Again, that kind of goes with the concept of going across the valley in a, in a straight line on one continuous route as much as possible to minimize that time that's involved. Two-way service is vital. Uh, again, this comes down to route design. If you have a loop on a route, 
Uh, loops are a great way to, to cover a lot of area, but loops are very inconvenient if you're trying to access any point within that loop because it means you have to ride all the way around, at least in one direction. Um, these are things that are very relevant to a transit user. Frequency, we're talking a lot about that here in this presentation. Higher frequency reduces waiting time, right? Uh, a bus route that runs every 30 minutes is not as useful or as convenient as a bus route that runs every 15 minutes. And that frequency matters not just during peak, not just during weekday peak, which is a difficult concept for us as it is. We'll go into that as well. But frequency matters at, at all times of day, at all times of week. You know, it, it's, there's not a lot of benefit to having really good service during a short period of time if your service beyond that time for completing two-way trips is, is really substandard. We have to think about that during all the different hours of the week. So overall, we strive to act in the interest of customers as a whole as doing so will also optimize the health of the overall system. You know, as, as planners, we all encounter this where there are sometimes interests that want to protect something that benefits a small group at the expense of a much larger group of existing or potential customers. And, you know, as, as I'm sure all of you know, we just have to do what we can to continue trying to focus the attention on the benefits of the greater good. And these, these concepts here regarding respecting customers' time help us relate back and be able to do that. So again, I mentioned uh, this is our existing system. And I say existing because it's going to be changing actually in three weeks. We are making some significant service improvements, which we'll be talking about later in the presentation. But as an example of the route design principles <laughs> that we just looked at, you <coughs> see how most of our routes traverse the valley going north, south, east, west in reasonably straight lines. There are some deviations. Uh, for example, on Charleston, we run service almost completely straight east-west on Charleston, except to deviate near downtown to serve our major transit center. So there, the connectivity benefits outweigh the additional time that's lost from the deviation. But you know, you'll notice in most places we try to stay the Decatur route stays on Decatur in a straight line. Uh, the Flamingo route runs up and down Flamingo. That's the concept. In some cases. You know, not all of the arterials in the valley are continuous, so we have to form routes, longer routes from a set of shorter arterials. For example, we have Cobol in the resort corridor. It's an important street, but it's not long enough to be its own route. So that is tied into, it uses a brief portion of the freeway, but then ties into Rancho. And then it goes up Rancho and becomes Simmons. So primarily, that route is operating in a straight line along Simmons, and Cobol connected with Rancho in the middle, right? So that, that's the concept behind much of our system. And again, you also notice there are not too many loops. Uh, you know, there, there's some towards the end of the routes, which is normal in any system to see loops towards the end of a route. But you know, you don't want to have a loop here on Flamingo. You don't want to come off of Flamingo at Decatur to go down to Twain to serve something that's on Twain because you've got a few customer requests to do that because you would be inconveniencing everyone who's trying to ride through that area, who's trying to pass through that area. So I want to focus on frequency here for a while because frequency is one of the most important elements of whether or not transit is actually useful and will generate ridership. So what we have here is showing the history of transit in Las Vegas, of RTC in particular, showing how over time we increase the frequency on many of our routes and how that has followed with the trend in ridership. So back in 1994, so 22 years ago in this city, there were only four bus routes that ran every 30 minutes. There was one bus route that ran every 20 minutes and one bus route that ran every 15 minutes. There were about 25 other routes that ran every 60 minutes. So the vast majority of the system was very low frequency. So there were very few major transit corridors. Throughout the, the mid-90s, the RTC made a lot of investments in improving frequency, and the ridership growth that occurred during this time, this is the type of thing that, that this is 
a big part of the reason why RTC in 1997 uh, won the AFTA award for System of the Year. Because these types of ridership gains on, in a transit system in a major metropolitan area, these don't happen very often. And the way this happened was because of the additional service, the additional frequency that was being added. And you can, again, track this over time where when frequency has went down, ridership has went down. Uh, you know, you can see throughout the, the mid-2000s, we were adding service again as the economy was good. The economy tanked. We had to cut service. I was a part of that. That's where a lot of this gray hair came from. Uh, we got down to, back in, in 2013, we kind of hit rock bottom in terms of our frequencies and you know, the ridership again matches pretty well. And the past four years, we've been adding service. We've been adding about four to five percent a year, and that's, again, more of what we're going to talk about here today. And, and this is, you know, this should be obvious. Higher frequency means shorter waiting times, and that means transit is more traffic. And this, this is a demonstration of what frequency does to service. So again, going back to that mid-90s, corridors like Rainbow, uh, Pecos, Desert Inn Lamb, Nellis, these corridors were all once an hour at one time. Uh, those are depicted by the red bars. Frequency on those routes were all increased every 30 minutes, and you can see the tremendous impact that had on ridership. After one year, the bar show, showing in red, that's what happened going from 60 minutes to 30 minutes. The green bar shows what it looked like after three years because as we see with frequency improvements, it takes time for that additional ridership to build. It takes time for the awareness that a corridor has been upgraded, that there is uh, you know, a major improvement taking place for folks to potentially make locational decisions based on these improvements. That all takes time to materialize. Uh, and this graph was actually used to demonstrate the merits to increasing this route, uh, the 217 on Warm Springs, actually serving much of downtown Henderson, was used to help justify improvements there as well that occurred last year. Uh, we're still waiting on the first full year of ridership, but it's, again, it's trending in a similar direction. We're likely to see right around 60,000 for the first year of being at 30 minutes compared to being at 60. Same thing happened when historically we went from 30 minutes to 20 minute frequency. And, and to bring home this point, ridership increased 43% from, uh, from when the route was every 30 minutes, three years later to when it was every 20 minutes. This is monthly ridership, by the way. But the service hours only increased, only increased by 34%. So what that means is that buses on this route we added more buses to the route to make it more frequent, but the buses were actually more crowded after we made this change than they were before. We were bringing in more additional riders than the extra service that we put in because it was just that much more attractive to potential customers. So we talked a little bit about ridership and frequency. A really important concept to understand in terms of evaluating transit routes and their effectiveness, their, their efficiency, boardings per revenue hour, BRH. This is an, an industry standard measure of productivity. And so a, a revenue hour is equivalent to a labor hour, to a man hour. Uh, one bus where 40 passengers boarded one hour means 40 boardings per revenue hour. So if you have a transit route where there are 10 buses operating on a route, for a given hour, and each of those buses are averaging 40 customers getting on during that hour, well, you've got 400 customers on the total route, 10 buses, you've got 40 boarding for every hour on the route. Now, BRH, again, incredibly important efficiency metric, but that doesn't mean the same as passenger loads. If you have, in this example, of 40 passengers boarding one bus in an hour, that doesn't mean there's 40 passengers on board the bus at the same time. It just means over that hour trip that 40 people got on that bus at some point. Customers are coming and going all the time on most routes, so you might have 40 boardings in an hour, but you might only have 20 of those customers on board at any one given time, because some have already gotten off, some are getting on for the trip, et cetera. So boardings for every hour by route, how does it look for our system? First of all, the RTC's overall boarding for revenue hour are in the high 40s, mid to high 40s, and that is very high by national standards. Uh, the average for a system our size is around 30. 
Uh, the nationwide average for all transit systems, and you include smaller systems, is just over 20. There's not a lot of systems that average above 50. At that point, you're generally talking about just the largest cities. Uh, RTC is extremely efficient in terms of our productivity, uh, but of course, part of that comes from not having as much resources to potentially serve what's out there as, as, as we may want. Uh, but in terms of the corridors and how they rank, as you would probably expect, the strip, uh, the double deck service on the strip, the deuce on the strip is our highest productivity service at over 80 boardings per revenue hour. So every bus that's out there on the strip is boarding a little over 80 customers an hour on average. Just behind that is our BRT route, the Strip and Downtown Express, also operating the North Corridor. These two routes are really work together as a pair. But what I think is a really important story is that it's not just the Strip that helps make RTC Transit as efficient as it is. It's also a lot of our major arterials in the valley. And, and it, the list of high productivity routes kind of reads like a list of major corridors in the valley. Uh, Maryland Parkway being number one off strip, Las Vegas Boulevard North, Tropicana, Flamingo, Charleston, etc. Uh, as you go further down the list, you get into corridors that are routes that are less frequent, in some cases more suburban, some routes that are a little more direct, <coughs> productivity goes down. So. so the RTC uh, boardings per revenue hour and a policy document that we that we abbreviate as specs, the service performance and capacity standards, it assigns a boarding per, re per revenue hour range based on the peak frequency. Because we, we can't expect a route that's operating at once an hour to achieve the type of ridership and efficiency as a route that's operating every 15 minutes. It's just not able to appeal to nearly as many customers. So we have to set expectations differently. We don't expect transit service on Flamingo. Uh, transit service on Flamingo should be more efficient than transit service on, say, Alta or uh, Vegas Owens, for example. Right. So what we've set are different ranges that we expect a route to be operating at in terms of its mornings per revenue hour based on its frequency. So right now, on RTC's transit system, this is what it looks like in terms of our peak frequency. The majority of our service is routes that operate every 30 minutes. Uh, we do have nine routes that operate every 15 minutes, what we brand as frequent service. These are the corridors that basically you can show up and you don't really need a schedule. It's so frequent that your, your waiting time is generally minimal. We have nine such corridors now. We'd like to have more. That's part of what we're going to talk about. But this is generally our system today. 23 routes every 30 minutes, nine routes every 15 minutes, two routes in between in 20 minutes. And we still have five routes that are every 60 minutes. Those are our really low productivity services that uh, with the limited funding we have, it's difficult to justify uh, putting more resources onto those corridors. However, uh, many of our existing routes are currently overperforming their frequency category, overperforming compared to this. If we evaluate these routes compared to this, we see that the routes shown in green are overperforming. So what that means is that these are corridors that the ridership is there, the demand is there for better frequency, for more frequent service, and we'd love to add it. Uh, of course, the constraint is funding, right? And in some cases, uh, the routes are overperforming by a little bit. In other cases, some routes are overperforming by a lot. Uh, for instance, service along Nellis, service along Eastern, are still in the 30 minute category. Those are routes that could probably support 15 minutes. We're still trying to get them up to 20 minutes. And we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, funding as well as we go, as we go through. Uh, just a quick terminology, I'm not gonna go into too much detail on this, but just because our route is overperforming, as we see here, this doesn't mean that customers are being left behind. It doesn't mean that trips are over capacity. Uh, it means that they are very efficient and they qualify for more service, but the capacity is, is still there for those customers, it's just not as convenient as we would like, right? A over, an overcapacity trip, we don't have many of those in our system because we have a lot of large buses and we, we track this very carefully to make sure that we're not denying customers. 
Uh, but overcapacity trips are, are uh, a much, they, they, they raise the stakes. You, know, you, you have to resolve that as quickly as possible. Um, the other key here is not just frequency. We've talked about peak a lot. But we also need to talk about the hours in which those frequencies are in effect. Because it's not just about peak. What does peak mean? Well, that's one of the challenges here for RTC. This is what ridership actually looks like by hour in our system. In a lot of places, you see the traditional type of morning increase in service. A lot of buses go back to the garage in the middle of the day, and then they come back out in the afternoon, the evening. That's not how it works in Las Vegas. That's not how our demand works. And it's probably not a surprise to any of you that are familiar with the traffic patterns in the valley. Uh, our ridership in the mornings, our ridership at 9 and 10 a.m., 11 a.m., is significantly higher than it is at 7 or 8 a.m. Ridership continues to build throughout the, the day to the point where weekday afternoons are the busiest time for the system. And then we see a, a pretty quick decline in ridership going to the evenings, but then it stays fairly high going through the evenings. And this doesn't take into account the amount of service that's put out there either. Part of, uh, part of the chicken and the egg is that Ridership decreases pretty quickly in the evenings, going from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m., for example, but we also decrease our frequencies pretty quickly around that time. So part of it's a response to that. So of course, we need to strike a balance between supporting the region's economy and workforce while remaining efficient with the limited funding we have in terms of what hours do we operate these frequencies that we're talking about, what is peak. So here I'm going to show what we call frequency infographics. Just really focus on the color coding. Uh, the blue means 15 minute service. That's the best service. Red is the worst service. Red is, is hourly. And the green, kind of light green is 30 minutes. The dark green is 20 minutes. So blue, dark green, light green, going into yellows, oranges, and then red, right? More blue, more green is better than, than oranges. So weekdays at 4 p.m., that's what our system looks like. Weekdays at 6 a.m., weekday mornings, there's a handful of routes that are less frequent. Uh, here's one, here's one. So it, it looks a little bit different, but it's still fairly similar. Black, by the way, means no service at that time of day. In the evenings, however, we get to 9 p.m., and this is what our transit system looks like right now at 9 p.m. And again, this is a time where, especially for our existing transit riders, you think about the type of jobs that a lot of our existing transit riders work, food service, retail, security, uh, the resorts. These hours may not be as relevant to us, but 9 p.m. is a very relevant time to a lot of those jobs. And you can see how our existing system, unfortunately, is much less convenient to use at 9 p.m. than it is at 4 p.m. Similarly, on Saturdays, a Saturday morning, you can see what that looks like. Saturday afternoon is a little bit better, but if you compare even Saturday afternoon with weekday afternoons, there's still quite a few routes that are much less frequent. There's a lot more 60-minute routes on Saturdays than there are during the week. Again, similar on Sunday. Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, similar story. And the other key here is that off-peak frequencies are inconsistent even among routes that have the same peak frequency. So for example, the 117 and 119 here are both every 30 minutes on weekday afternoons, but outside of weekday afternoons, their frequency is very different. 117 is 30 minutes pretty much all these hours. The 119 is 60 minutes most of the other hours. So there's no consistency to it. You might know that a route is every 30 minutes uh, on a weekday afternoon, but that doesn't tell you anything about what the frequency is going to be like at another time. And that applies to something like the 201, 202 as well. They're both every 15 minutes here, but other times one route is 20 minutes, the other route is 15 minutes. So this is where we'd like to get as a system. This is where we would like our frequencies to go. This is where we think based on our ridership and efficiency, we can still operate a very efficient service. Uh, you know, here you can see there's major improvements in morning, early evening, and Saturday frequencies become the same as peak frequencies. So this is a Monday through Saturday chart. So this, we would like for frequencies to be on routes that are every 15 minutes on weekday afternoons. We'd like that 15 minute service to be Monday through Saturday 
from 6 a.m. all the way until 8 p.m., right? And then all routes within that category would be consistent. Every route that's 15 minutes on a weekday afternoon would go to 20 minutes at 8 p.m. Right, so there would be there would be uh, the ability to very easily convey frequency information to customers. So this is where we'd like to go. It's just a matter of funding, right? Uh, here I'm just gonna I'm going to kind of just toggle between these charts again. Pay attention to the color patterns. That's really what we're trying to look at here. So this is the full frequency of our system on weekdays right now by route by hour of day. Again, blue and green are good. Blue, dark green is, and, and dark green particularly <coughs> good. Red, particularly black. Bad, orange is kind of in the middle. So this is what we have today on weekdays. This is where we would like to be with the ideal scenario. So we're trying to go from this to this. You can see not only are there more routes that would be at 15 minute service in the middle of the day, but you get much better service in the evening hours and you get that consistency between routes. Similar thing for Saturdays. This is our existing Saturday service. Uh, you know, it's significantly less convenient than our weekday service. This is what it looks like now. This is what we'd like to get to. And finally, Sundays. Our Sunday system today, Sunday afternoons are okay on some routes, but it's generally quite less convenient than it is on weekdays. And again, that's really relevant to a large portion of our customer base. Sundays, this is where we would like to get to. It's very similar on Sundays to Monday through Saturday. The difference just being Sunday mornings. Sunday mornings start out much more slowly. It, you know, if you've ever been out at 6, 7 a.m. on a Sunday morning, it looks a lot different than on a 6, 7 a.m. on a weekday morning. So that kind of does it for frequencies. I want to talk now about new routes and major extensions, how we consider those. So as you can imagine, we receive requests for service from all areas of the valley. Uh, Anthem, Mountain's Edge, uh, North Fish Street, more of Centennial Hills, more of Henderson, anywhere you can imagine, right? But of course our resources are limited. We have to have some method to prioritize and rank these, all of these different requests, right? And some peripheral areas cannot support efficient transit service. There are some areas of the valley where no matter how many resources we had as an agency, it would not be a prudent or wise use of, of public funds to be operating 15 minute bus service in Anthem. Uh, the land use and the potential ridership just isn't there regardless of the funding. But it doesn't mean that all newer areas, we have to be careful not to bias against newer areas because some of the newer areas are developing in a manner that strongly justifies transit service, right? If the land use in a new area is similar or more dense than an existing area that has efficient transit service, it's reasonable that ridership in the new area would also be sufficient to support service, right? So we know if we have an area today where we have a bus route that's operating at 30 boardings per revenue hour, and we have another corridor that we're looking at that has similar land use, uh, similar density, for example, and can potentially be operated, uh, you know, the arterial design is similar, the street network is similar. It, it's likely that once the service matured, we would have similar type of ridership. And so our specs document, which we, I talked about in terms of frequency, it also, it, it outlines that methodology that we need to evaluate and rank potential corridors for new or extended routes. And again, these are not for major capital investments. We're not talking about studying for dedicated right-of-way. We're talking about studying for basic local bus service, right? And the methodology we use for this is based on a cost-benefit evaluation that considers the population and employment figures as well as system connectivity and compares that to the cost of providing the service. So we can see uh, you know, how many people how many jobs are within a potential candidate route, and we can pretty easily determine what the cost would be for, provide, for providing that service at any given frequency, and by comparing those two and doing that for many different candidate corridors, we can see which new routes or extensions have the best potential in terms of cost efficiency for when we are able to invest in new service. 
uh, specifically about about 50%, 50 percent, 52 percent of the of what we need to operate the system comes through fair revenue. Uh, almost all of the rest of that is sales tax, a little bit of advertising, very little, if any, on federal sources. Federal funding does not really pay for transit operations, with a couple exceptions, but it's primarily capital if you're lucky. Right. Uh, so each year, our RTC finance team, right, they crunch the numbers and determine based on the budgetary outlook what our resources are likely to be, what we can potentially afford to do. And you know, we'll put together a presentation as well and try to get as much as we can to improve transit service. Uh, but of course, it's limited to that sales tax and fair revenue growth. We have been very fortunate the past four years, after going through three years of service cuts from the start of the recession up until middle of 2012, every six months, every nine months, we were cutting transit service four or five percent each time. We cut almost 20 percent from where we were in 2008 to when we hit the bottom in 2012. Uh, but fortunately, in the past four years, as the economy has been doing really well and has recovered, we've been able to basically add back at four to five percent a year. So it's been, you know, it's, it's been an interesting time. It's been a great time to be able to improve service. We've added, um, in this year coming up, November 6th in three weeks, that's our annual service change. We generally make major changes once a year. And this year we're making a 4.5% increase. That's 70,000 additional hours of transit service that are going to be on the road. And that has a real impact. It's a real benefit for those 200,000 boardings per day. Uh, in our system, and I'll get into a little detail on this. And so the transit planning team, myself, everyone out there in the crowd, and uh, my boss, Nathan Goldberg, we, we work together to recommend how to invest the additional hours, uh, whatever we can afford from finance, whatever they say we can afford, where is the greatest need? Where, where should we be putting those hours? Where, where can we get the, the best bang for our buck, right? And we have to consider, we've talked about both of these, we have to consider frequencies, and that means frequencies not just at peak, but also during that off-peak time. You know, do you increase service on a route on weekday afternoons, or do you start addressing some of those Saturday and Sunday deficiency, evening deficiencies, et cetera? So that's really about improving existing service, but we also have to consider extending or adding new routes that are the highest cost benefit, right, for the, the growth that's occurring. So that's the new service. So we have to consider both improving existing service through frequency increases and extending service through new routes and extensions, adding new service. So how does all of this that I've talked about here, how does this relate to concrete projects? Again, the type of planning that I do on a day-to-day -day basis, we're generally working on uh, a year's worth of service improvements at a time. You know, we're trying to look a few years into the future, but it's all based on available funding. It's all based, it's all based on revenue, right? So what are we actually able to do this year with that 70,000 service hours? How is transit service going to get better in three weeks for our customers? I'm gonna go through that. So here we have an extension of one of our routes. The 203 is basically the Spring Mountain Desert Inn Lamb route cutting through the center of the valley, cutting right through Las Vegas Boulevard and Spring Mountain. Major corridor carries about 8,000 people per weekday. Uh, this route, we are proposing to extend it, we are planning to extend it to the town center 215 area. So this is the current map, and this is what it's going to look like in three weeks. You can see here the difference. Currently, the route ends at Grand Canyon, and it's ended here at Grand Canyon for many, many years, going back to the mid-90s, late 90s, when that's pretty much where the development ended, right? Uh, you know, we know there's different, <laughs> sometimes you get those customer comments that say, hey, did you know that there is now development at Town Center and 215? And of course, you have to, uh, you have to take that stride. Of course, we're aware of it, it's just a matter of having the funding to get there, so we finally do. We finally have that funding. We're finally able to afford this, prioritize this, and uh, in this case, we're picking up, by extending to the 215 Town Center area, we're picking up the University of Phoenix and Roseman University, right? So that's pretty significant. As well as about uh, six additional apartment condo complexes, right? So you're looking at probably 1,500, 2,000 additional multifamily units 
that will now have transit service, as well as you know, hundreds of single family homes and these two universities. Uh, and we're able to do this at a, at a very low cost, 2,200 annual service hours. That's, that's quite low. Um, it, that, the increase that's shown here, that's the percent increase of our entire budget. So in order to do this, we had to increase our entire service by 0.14%. So it, it's fairly minor. The benefits are not, I mean, serving two universities is significant, six additional apartment complexes, that's good. But it's not a major extension, but relative to the cost, it makes it a really good deal. So it, it, it rose to the top of that prioritization list. It's a minimal investment with a larger return on investment. Still relatively small, but much larger than the investment. And it also, going back to that route design concept, right? It minimizes unnecessary redundancy, which I guess is just redundancy. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, right now the route, the 203 route, as part of its turnaround loop, is going up to the corner of Sahara and Fort Apache. Well, we already have a route on Sahara. We already have a route on Fort Apache. We don't need a third route, a second east-west route, competing with Sahara, coming up to this corner. It's just redundant. The only reason we go there is to turn around right now. So as we extend, we eliminate that redundancy and keep it in a straight line. You know, we keep it straight through here until we have to do a turnaround loop here. Right. That's how it works when you need to extend a local bus route. Another example of an extension. Um, here, this is kind of a it's kind of a restructuring package. It's a little more complicated. Uh, we are extending one of our routes, the 101, which is our rainbow route. We're extending that, and we're reconfiguring another route. So the 101 shown here in blue. This is the current 101. You can see it goes down to Rainbow and Patrick, and then it does a turnaround loop and goes back north. So right now, what that means is that. If you're a customer coming from anywhere on Rainbow, or you're coming from Flamingo and Decatur, you're coming from Charleston and Valley View, whatever, and you're trying to get to, say, Rainbow and 215, which those that are familiar with the area, major, major retail area, a huge number of jobs, uh, especially for those that tend to use transit, a lot of activity down there. Right now, if you want to go from Flamingo and Decatur or anywhere on Rainbow down to Rainbow and 215, you would think you just take the Rainbow bus but you have to get off the rainbow bus in this area and transfer to a branch of the Tropicana bus to continue further. Uh, so that's not intuitive, right? That's not simple. Customers would expect if you're going somewhere on rainbow to be able to take the rainbow bus, not to have to transfer from the rainbow bus to a branch of the Tropicana bus. So what we're doing here is we're simplifying things. We're keeping the rainbow bus on rainbow all the way down. And in that process, we are taking uh, the branch of the Tropicana route that currently comes down to this Rainbow and 215 area, and we're using that instead to serve West Russell, including Opportunity Village. Uh, but this portion of West Russell is also developing as a corridor with the type of, some of it's still undeveloped, but with the type of land use that as it's developing, you know, we expect it can justify that level of transit service about every 30 minutes. And so this concept, this simplifying service, we'd love to do more of this, keep the rainbow bus on rainbow, have the Tropicana, branch of the Tropicana route serve another corridor that currently doesn't have it. But it, it, takes, it takes money, it takes service. Uh, in this case, this one's about 7,500 annual service hours. Um, by the way, for context, a service hour for us costs around $65, $70. So if you do the math, uh, if you're looking at, say, 10,000 service hours, you're looking at around $650,000, $700,000 a year, right? So 7,500 7, annual service hours, that's somewhere in the neighborhood of half a million dollars a year in order to do this, so you know, it's expensive. <clears throat> Probably the most high profile thing that we are doing with this November service change is launching a new route. New routes always get a lot of attention. They're very easy to explain. They make for great press releases. Uh, this route here was our highest ranked, again, using that, that prioritization process, was our highest ranked contender in terms of cost effectiveness. Uh, this will establish a route on South Maryland Parkway heading out from our South Strip Transfer Terminal, basically along Paradise and Maryland Parkway beginning at sunset, going down to St. Rose Parkway, and then at St. Rose Parkway, it becomes the start of a Horizon Ridge route, going up Horizon Ridge towards the district, ultimately terminating the district. So for this route, there are 65,000 residents, 
33,000 jobs within a half mile of this new route. So there's a lot of potential. There's also 16 apartment or condo complexes along this route that are currently at least a half mile away from any other transit route, right? So that's, that's 16 multifamily complexes that are gaining transit for the first time. We also have a major shopping center at Horizon Ridge and Green Valley Parkway that has a, a Target, a Sprouts, that currently has no transit service. It's over a mile away from the nearest route, right? That's several hundred retail jobs that are otherwise inaccessible via transit that this will add. And it, it produces a dramatic decrease in travel time for some transit trips. And here's, here's the example. Again, this is where route design is really important. So let's say right now uh, someone wants to go from Eastern and Horizon Ridge, very busy corner, a lot of retail activity, multifamily nearby, and wants to go to the district area, Green Valley Ranch, right? That's only a couple miles. If you're driving this five minute drive, to Horizon Ridge to Carnegie, you're gonna be there, right? In our system today, this is what a transit rider has to do. If you take transit, you wanna go between these locations, it's going to take 68 minutes today, and it's going to be a nine mile trip. Because in order to go east-west, you have to go up to Warm Springs. We don't have an east-west route right now, south of Warm Springs. So as you can imagine, this is the type of thing when you hear the term, I don't like to use it very often, but when you hear the term transit dependent, this is transit dependent. The only person who's going to do this is someone who absolutely has to. Uh, in fact, someone who's able bodied is probably going to walk or bike much faster than this, right? But with the 122 in place, taking that same trip, this is what it'll look like. Just following the path of 122, the same way that you would go with driving, right? By having a route on Horizon Ridge, at least for that segment, we're able to eliminate all of this out of direction trip, all of that. So that's, that's, that's the type of, of change that actually brings in new transit riders. Again, it's not necessarily the type of change that makes headlines, it's not going to get, um, it's not gonna cause a major mode shift in the valley, but for the population that uses transit and those that have, um, that are more likely to use transit, this is the type of thing that's going to make a big difference in their day-to-day -day lives. And going back to the theory behind the route design, so the green line shows what the route is going to do. The X's, the green X's show one path that we looked at and ultimately dismissed. And the red X's show another path that we looked at and ultimately dismissed. So the reason for the red X's is that there's a major employer down here, the Levi Strauss factory. Uh, they have a few hundred employees, and, and we've had uh, quite a few requests from them for service, right? We would love to be able to serve them, but in order to do that, again, this goes back to route design. If you have a route that is on Maryland Parkway, and you have a route that's on Horizon Ridge, there's going to be quite a bit of customers from this area, everyone from this area, from the district, Horizon Ridge, anywhere through here, that's trying to use this route to connect up to all the other routes heading towards the resort corridor, Right, you have to be on here. If the route were to deviate down to the Levi Strauss facility, all of the customers on this bus would have to endure the extra time and distance that's required to do this every day of their lives on every trip. Right? So, you know, we might serve a handful of additional customers by coming to this facility. We might have 10, 20 people a day that use this service. And and that's important. That would be great to be able to serve, but in the process we would likely be inconveniencing a few hundred customers a day that are riding through this area that are just trying to get to their destination, right? So, so important with route design to be as, again, as direct as possible. And the reason why I'm showing the green lines, this would actually have made it a little more direct. We could have done this. But that's where the balance comes in, right? As planners, we all have to do this. We sometimes have to sacrifice the ideal to uh, achieve some sort of interim compromise, if you will. So we decided we can, we can accommodate a little bit of out of direction travel, a little bit of extra time. Uh, there's quite a bit of benefit to doing so in terms of the multifamily that we get over here and getting a little bit closer for the folks that are going to walk to Levi Strauss, but without having to take all the additional time to do that. This additional time relative to this was considered acceptable, uh, but not having to do all of that stuff here and there, right? So that's the kind of real world trade off that you have to make. So the cost for this service it's about 21,000 annual service hours. 
That's about a 1.3% increase in our entire transit budget. So again, at about $70 an hour, $70 an hour times 20,000, you're looking at about $1.4 million a year. So it's, it's a significant cost. And going back to frequency, in terms of what we're doing here for the November service changes, we talked a lot about frequency. Here's what we're doing this year. We are making frequent service more meaningful. And what that means is that we're increasing two of the Valley's busiest routes. Maryland Parkway, which again, a lot of you are probably familiar with what RTC is studying right now. Uh, Maryland Parkway and Flamingo, which we're actually just about to wrap up uh, major project on Flamingo. Both of those routes we are going to be improving to what we're kind of calling internally ultimate frequent service standards, which means better evening, Saturday, Sunday, and overnight service. So for example, top line here shows on weekdays, this is Maryland Parkway currently, as of today. This is Maryland Parkway as of the November service improvements, right? And the weekday frequency by hour. So again, just looking at the colors, you can see how it's improving. Overnight frequency will improve from 40 minutes, 45 minutes to 30 minutes. Evening frequency, right, where right now we go down to 20 minutes early and then we go down to mid 20. That stays at 20 minutes much later. Same thing's happening on Flamingo. Right now, this is what Flamingo looks like, the top line. The second line is Flamingo with the, with the upcoming improvements. Again, getting rid of some yellows and reds, making it all green, bringing in more blue. And it becomes especially dramatic on Saturdays and Sundays. Right now on Sundays, both of these routes, these major, major transit corridors, both of these are carrying over 10,000 boardings per day. Uh, even on Sundays, these routes are carrying seven, eight, nine thousand 9,000 boardings a day. On Sunday right now, both of these routes, even in the afternoon, are every 20 minutes. We're increasing that to 15 minutes. And again, the evening frequency increases as well. So this is costing frequency just like new routes. I mean, it's, it's expensive. It's about 14,000 annual service hours, close to a 1% increase in our total budget. Yes? Does that have anything to do with trying to increase ridership so that, I know that Maryland Parkway corridor in particular is trying to get some maybe federal funding that has some ridership numbers attached to it, or you want to have increased ridership to try to get that funding? It wasn't done with that being the intention, right. but it will certainly increase ridership and, and help with that. Right. Um, the reason why this is being done is because going back to those uh, boardings per revenue hour, those specs thresholds of what we expect a route to be performing at, based on uh, the frequency that we're operating on these routes on Saturdays and Sundays, they qualify for, for better service. There's a lot of customers who are using that service. And as we looked at previously, RTC's history has been very clear. When we increase frequency, we increase ridership. So, um, right now, Flamingo on weekdays is at about 12,300, 12, I think it was. Um, I'm expecting, just me and I, just my estimate, I think we'll be somewhere in the 13,000 range next year. Uh, we'll probably see on Flamingo at least a 10% increase in ridership, maybe 15%. Maryland Parkway, probably something similar. And that means an extra 1,000, extra 1,500 transit trips a day. That's very significant. I mean, there, there are some rail projects, there are some BRT projects that bring in a couple thousand boardings total that are major capital projects. The other major initiative that we're doing with frequencies here in three weeks is we're increasing free evening frequency on a lot of rounds. Uh, so this is our current frequencies in the evening hours, 7 p.m., 8 p.m., 9 p.m., 10 p.m. The routes where you see the white border, that indicates a frequency increase. So for instance, here on Paradise and Swinson, we're currently operating around 40 minutes. It's going to go up to 30 minutes. Again, Maryland Parkway going from 20-something to 20-minute frequency. Some more dramatic improvements like down on Bonanza, we currently go towards hourly frequency in the evenings. That's going to stay half hour for longer. Craig Road currently goes to Hourly, et cetera. So 10 routes will see more frequent service in the evening. Spring Mountain, Desert Inn. Uh, you know, so what that means is that for those jobs, for so many of those transit jobs, for so many of those transit trips that take place during the evening hours, this is a major improvement uh, in the quality of life for transit users. Having a route go from 60 minutes to 30 minutes, that's a huge deal if you're reliant on that service. 
And so this one costs about 12,500 annual service hours, about eight tenths of a percent. If you add up all of these increases that I talked about here, they come up to about 4.5% overall increase in our service. So in summary, even at four to five percent increase per year for the past four years, we still have many unmet needs based on uh, based on these qualifications for additional frequency, based on where we think we can operate uh, new or extended transit routes efficiently, right? So ranking and prioritization is key and necessary. We always try to strive to provide the maximum benefit with whatever resources we have, whether that's four and a half percent. Next year, it's likely not going to be nearly that much. We might only have a couple percent to work with. We're going to do everything we can to maximize the benefits of whatever we're getting, right? BRH and mornings per revenue hour and cost effectiveness, along with sound route design principles that we talked about, are what we use to guide the way. That's how we do these annual service changes, annual service improvements that, again, don't get nearly as much attention or press as our major projects, and, and that's very understandable, but that have a huge impact on the lives of trans drivers. And going back to that chart that I showed earlier with the ideal frequencies, right? The current versus the ideal frequencies for uh, weekdays, Saturdays, and Sundays. Just for perspective, in order to get to that fully ideal scenario, that's about a 25% increase in our total service today, right? So that's, unfortunately, that's not something we're going to see in a short period of time. If we're able to continue adding a couple percent a year, we might be there in 10 years. Uh, but there's a lot. There's a lot to do. We're, we're still quite a ways from where we'd like to be in terms of frequency, which guides how can we get our services. And so I've talked enough continuously. I would love to open it up to any comments or questions. So we're doing on time. Okay. Got about 15 minutes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I guess a couple here. Um, so I, I understand and I, I totally get why you have to balance out uh, uh, your productivity with the you know, in terms of warnings for for regular vehicle hour and uh, um, look at it from that lens. But as um, as there's been more and more demand for transit and as there's been more requests for for service in other parts of the area that are low density and are, are just not served right now. Would you consider coverage versus productivity or coverage goals versus productivity in some of these newer developing areas, like, like for example, Summerland West, Sky Canyon? Um, yeah, you might not be getting a lot of riders out of it, but if you at least plant the seed, could you eventually get people to start using it? And, you know, would you consider implementing things like, you know, peak hour only service, like ex peak hour express services that's done in pretty much every city across the country to bring people into downtown the strip major employment centers? That's an excellent question. And it actually uh, touches on one of the most important discussions and debates balancing coverage versus frequency or intensity, right, or ridership, however you want to call it, but that, that, that disconnect between needing to invest more in existing service versus the need or perceived need to add new routes and extensions into new areas. So how do you, how do you balance those resources? Um, and I've thought a lot about this and you know, searched a lot about this. Ultimately, there's no formula for this. There, there's no formula that says you should invest entirely in frequency or you should invest entirely in adding new routes, expanding your coverage. Um, a lot of it comes down to community values. And uh, you know, politics comes into that as well. Political influence comes into that as well. But it comes into what do we want to do as a community? Do we want to focus? our resources on having really good service in a smaller number of places, or do we want to have a lower level of service, um, in some cases, really mediocre service in more locations? So um, kind of as we're doing this year, in this example here, we're, we're trying to strike a balance. Um, we're doing 
two, two major extensions, we're adding a new route, but we're also increasing frequency on quite a few of our routes, so we're kind of mixing the two right now. Um, in terms of some of the newer areas, and especially in terms of peak hour service, one of the challenges we have there goes back to one of the early graphs that we looked at, which is that in our system, most cities do run uh, peak hour transit service, especially express routes, but most cities don't have anything that resembles this either. So it, it, it causes us to have to um, think about things a little differently. We actually have, right now, we have four freeway express routes, right, that are comparable to what a lot of cities have. Uh, the Centennial Express, some of you may be familiar with. Uh, the Henderson Downtown Express, the route that serves this campus. But those routes, we, they are express routes, they are designed to be more for traditional commuters, more so than our, our local routes. But you know, we find that the ridership on those, we run those routes from about 5 a.m. to about 10 or 11 p.m. And we find that the ridership, it's not on those routes, it's really not much different than what we see here for a lot of our other routes. There, there's more activity, there's more ridership on the Centennial Express, better productivity at noon than there is at 7 a.m. And it seems counterintuitive for those of us that work those hours, but for the, the market that's responding to our transit service right now, it's, the demand is, is more spread out. So that ends up increasing um, part of the challenge and cost of, of providing service to some of these newer areas because we've seen, we, we, we run peak hour service in the past. Um, in, in years past, RTC has run routes that operate just during morning and afternoon peak or for shorter periods of time. And generally, we've found that they're not as productive. So, when we're looking at new routes, we generally have to um, recognize that it's going to take a little bit more to get them off the ground in order for them to be successful. So that's part of the cost. So maybe just to, to follow up on that, sure. I mean, if, if this, let's just say Southern Nevada Strong and Henderson, Las Vegas, Clark County, their, their comprehensive or master plans say, you know, we want to increase transit service, we want to have the transit service as a mode that's more attractive, Right now, our, our mode share is what, right around 5%, maybe probably less than that, yeah. the, yeah. the 2 or 3%. 3% right is a good estimate. We want to try to increase that that share to, you know, to, we'll just say let's double, double the mode share. Right. It seems to me that it goes back to one of the statements you made very, at the very beginning on valuing people's time. And for me, I, you know, I'm a choice writer. If we wanted to track those choice writers, and get people like me, I, I, I took HDX here today, um, you have to really value time by getting people to where they need to go quickly. And, and that's, to me that says, you need to be focusing more on, on limited stop or express routes than, than your local routes because, you know, if, if it takes an hour to get from point A to point B, you're not gonna be able to get that mode share goal that those plans, I, I don't know, I mean, just you No, know, and, and you did on it again. Um, it's obvious, right? It's obvious that our service along say Flamingo is very slow. It operates at peak hour. Our service on Flamingo Road operates at about 11, 12 miles an hour. Um, that's not unusual for most of our arterials. Um, even our fastest arterial routes operate around 14, 15 miles an hour uh, on a weekday afternoon. Um, the, the challenge we have is that, again, Flamingo is a very slow route. It's also incredibly productive. Um, we have a lot of riders that rely on that service that are along the corridor. Um, so we, that's another balance that we have to strike between trying to add service and improve service for those that are really time sensitive versus recognizing uh, the needs that we have for just the basics. And it's something that as, if RTC is able to have, uh, you know, if, if if we had the type of funding environment that a lot of cities have, um, and we were able to add a significant amount of service, I think you'd see a lot of that service that's added would come in the form of overlays that make the service faster, limited and express type service. But it's hard to, from an equity standpoint, it's hard to run, so to speak, before you crawl, before you at least have that, that um, kind of baseline service there. Not so much from the sense of being a social service, but from the sense of having the productivity. I and mean, the HDX is actually a great example. Um, and routes like that get a lot of attention, and there are those who, who definitely value it. I live uh, 
near the Centennial Hills Transit Center specifically to use the Centennial Express route. As we're able to add, that's, we, we know that's a huge deficiency in our network and a, and a big part of the reason why our vote share is not higher. Um, it's just a matter of having the resources to be able to do both. Yes? Well, I was just going to say, you talked about quality of life. How much improvement are you making for quality of life to people who are choice riders instead of people who are dependent on it? Right. And they're spending, and most of us don't just go to work and come home every day. Most of us go drop off kids and do grocery shopping. So you're not just talking about maybe an hour or two a day. You're talking about multiple hours being wasted being on a bus right. all and day. Yes, and that's absolutely that true. That you could be spending educating your kids or a second job to reduce your income. So and that's why I get so excited about the improvements that we're actually able to make because you know, you're hitting on a frequency increase. It doesn't make the service any faster. Once you get on the bus, it's still going to be the same slow bus, but that's a problem. But right now, we have not only that problem, we also have the problem that it takes a long time just to get on the bus. So the bus is really slow, and you also have to wait a long time for it. So we're trying to address one, we're trying to address the frequency, so at least once the bus, are, once you're on the bus, it's going to take the same amount of time, at least you're not waiting as long for the bus to come. Or for a transfer. Right, for, exactly. When you're making transfers, frequency becomes extremely important as well. Um, it's, this is by no means the, the frequency increases that we're trying to make for new routes. That's by no means everything we'd like to have for an ideal transit service. We're just trying to get up to a higher level, a higher baseline. You know, we're still trying to take care of the basics, of course. So what are some of the influences then of like these last mile systems, partnerships with TNCs like Uber and Lyft and Bike yeah. Share? Again, great question. It's something that's um, coming up more and more. And um, RTC is actually getting ready to launch a request for information for potentially partnering with, um, well, it really, it really could be, it could be cabs as well, but TNCs, those types of services um, to, in, in this case, for this, for this, request for information, it's specific to paratransit service, but that's the direction that um, that the industry is kind of looking right now, is how uh, TNCs and even taxi cabs can potentially, or autonomous vehicles at some point, can be used to help resolve some of those first mile and last mile issues, as well as resolve, resolve the issue of what to do about coverage in some of these lower productivity areas, right? Um, you know, in my view, it's, it's difficult to see the geometry ever changing to where, you know, autonomous vehicles are not going to change the need to have transit service on major corridors like Flamingo and Charleston and Decatur. But autonomous vehicles and, uh, you know, Uber Lyft connections and so on can help in some of the areas where transit cannot operate efficiently, right? Uh, where there's just not the, the land use and the productivity to make it work. But still, even there, we have a bit of challenges. Even if you're going to subsidize the last mile, first mile, right, in some way, you're still subsidizing that. That's still coming from the same pot. So unfortunately, we're still stuck trying to balance our existing funding. That's one of the things that really gives me gray hair is that uh, you know, we talk about a lot of different projects, but when you're only able to increase service by maybe 3%, um, there's so much more to do that we're just not able to get to each year. It, that's, that's the part that's not as fun, having to tell folks, sorry, we don't, we don't have yeah. that. Well, I mean, and it just seems, and it's like looking at such a fine detail thing, but it seems odd that Levi's cared enough to coordinate mm -hmm. with you guys. It's like, well then, just operate a shuttle for a couple hours a day. And yep, and that's, that's also possible because uh, RTC has commuter services, club ride, right, ride sharing. Uh, that's also another possibility. There, there's a lot of different things. Fixed route transit is not going to be the solution to every problem. And that's why going back to the route design, we try to keep the routes as direct as possible to try to minimize <coughs> extra time. Right. Paul? Um, a friend of mine said once GIS is gee, I get on my bike um, and I ride through a park to a bus stop, put my bike on the bus and go to work. Has, has there been any work done to identify some of these park trails that could be used by people on buses? To get to buses? Maybe I should take this over to some of our ideal folks. It's Andrew, uh, <laughs> our honest feedback. Uh, but no, I, I know that you know, RTC, I mean, our, our MPO group, our MPO team, um, you know, they're, they're, we're working on a lot of different things when it comes to uh, how to integrate the modes. 
right? Obviously, the biking connection to transit is another key. Uh, we carry over 50,000 bicycles a month on our system, right? So there's, there's a lot of folks that use bicycles today to connect to our system, and everything we can do to improve the, the ped and, and bike modes um, obviously help transit as well. It, it's, it's, all transit riders are also pedestrians at some point, and some of them are also bicyclists, or potentially could and should be bicyclists. So anything to add, guys, to that? Yeah, I'll ask that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah. It's going to come down to the community. It's going to come down to um, what the community wants and what it expects out of our, our transit service. Um, I think it's important. So many folks in our community, uh, even even some of our thought leaders, don't have a good understanding of how transit funding works and, and how we're constrained and why we're constrained, right? Um, so that in, in order to in order to break through to that, we it's going to take a entirely new form of investment that we don't currently have to be able to do these larger projects. That's, that's obvious, right? Um, RTC is currently leading a group that's known as the Transportation Resource Advisory Committee, TRAC, and uh, that committee just wrapped up their work this past summer regarding roadway funding in the, uh, in the Las Vegas Valley and how to address some of the, fund some of the shortfalls there, um, part of which they, they recommended an increase. Uh, they, they, they highly recommended the uh, fuel revenue indexing extension that's on the ballot, uh, as well as they also recommended some, uh, some additional potential future funding measures to be looked into further, to be studied further. That same committee is now reconvening to discuss the transit side of the funding component of our transportation network to learn more about our existing transit funding and <clears throat> to potentially decide what we want to do as a region in terms of future transit funding. And RTC is also about to kick off, uh, Raymond, Raymond uh, Hess is leading uh, an, an initiative known as the High Capacity Transit Study uh, that's about to kick off in the next couple months to look at where in the valley uh, is going to be right for major transit investments, uh, you know, BRT, rail, et cetera, in the future. Um, so that kind of goes hand in hand with the funding. Part of the thinking is we need to formally <clears throat> make a list of all, the, all of the needs that we have, all the potential projects, and then from there put it out to the community and say, is this worth it to you? Do you, do you want this? And if so, how, how do you want to pay for it? Uh, so I, I wish I had better answers. Uh, yeah, the, 
the way you're saying you're discerning that uh, at radar and we already discussed about our plan for you. And then we have a, what we call a 10 year plan where we have a priorities for the next 10 years. Now, if everything that's in need or an urgent need to be uh, move up the, the category, we have to do it like, for instance, by, 19, uh, by 2020, that's when the greater stage is projected to be you know, realized. So when that time comes, if we have any plans to put any or increase any of additional transportation or transit along that area, we need to move up the priority. It depends on you know the need and the budget. And that's that's why this uh, presentation was called "Working Within Constraints." We, the financial side, it, it is. We know we can only make very limited improvements per each year at, at best. Um, so, going to the next level, RTC again. We're doing a handful of studies, and uh, that talk is just now starting to happen. But um, that's that's a whole other animal. Uh, well, we're actually, we're technically out of time. If anybody wants to stay for any other questions, feel free. But uh, that's, that's all I have. <laughs>